I am honored to be here. Steve is more than a friend. Pastor Steve is more than a friend, uh, more than a ministry partner. He is really a, a confidant and a counselor to me. He's quite frankly about the first one I turn to uh, on, on the tough issues of life. I've been with him so many times on the phone and numbers of times in person, not even that long ago, for three hours. I bent his ear and said, here's where I am. Help me sort through these issues. So uh, I, I cannot articulate what you mean personally to me in, in, in my life. And I love this church, Grace Church. I've never been on this campus until yesterday. I've been on the other one, other campus, a number of times in South Park. I've never been here before, but what, it's a really special honor to be here with all of you today. I'm going to talk to you about the word, the covenant. The word covenant, or the phrase blood covenant. That one word, or that one phrase, help, will help us understand the Bible more than any other term. If you understand the nature of the covenant, the steps of the ancient covenant-making ceremony, it will cause hundreds, perhaps even thousands, but hundreds of verses come to life and have meaning. As I walk through right now, I'm going to walk through the steps of the ancient covenant-making ceremony of the ancient Near East. When I say ancient, what does that mean? 2,000 years ago, Christ was born on the earth. 2,000 years before that, Abraham. So we're rolling back 4,000 years. That's what I mean by ancient. When I say Eastern, we're talking about the Eastern half of the globe. When I say Near East, that sometimes is interspersed with the word Middle East. It's not Far East, China, but it's the area around present-day Israel, all of that area. So in, ancient, in the ancient Near East, there was a common practice called the cutting of the covenant or the steps of the covenant-making ceremony. Your Bible does not discuss them because everybody in that culture already knew those steps. They participated in it. But your Bible is literally, in essence, the steps of the ancient covenant-making ceremony. Let me attempt to explain this to you right now. Let's suppose Steve Riggle, Jim Garlow, are tribal chiefs in the ancient Near Eastern world. And we're going to cut a covenant with each other. It means we're going to become one, unified with each other. So we would get in an open field before a crowd of witnesses. We would stand facing each other. And we would begin the steps of the covenant-making ceremony. Now, when you think of a wedding, for example, if I said there's going to be a wedding here tomorrow, you know what's going to happen. The bride would enter. Uh, there, there would be a, a brief sermonette. There would be uh, then the wedding vows. There would be the exchange of rings. There would be the kiss. There would be the pronouncement. There would be the processional. There would be the wedding cake. She'd feed him. He'd feed her. You know all those things comprise a wedding ceremony. Those are the steps of a wedding ceremony. Well, just like there are steps in a wedding ceremony, there are steps in a covenant or a cutting of a covenant ceremony. And what are those steps? If Pastor Steve Riggle and I were to cut a covenant in the ancient Near Eastern world as two tribal chiefs, we would go out in an open field before a crowd of witnesses. <clears throat> we would face each other. And the first thing we would do would be the exchange of robes. The exchange of robes, by the way, you have sermon outlines. Pull those out. That will be helpful to you. I'm just going to give an overview quickly, and then we're going to jump into the verses that you see on there in just a moment. We would exchange robes. The reason we would exchange robes is that's an exchange of identity. They say, oh, here comes Steve. Oh, wait a minute. That's, 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 that's Steve's robe, but that's not Steve's walk. That's, well, that's Jim's walk, but he's wearing Steve's robe. The confusion of identity. And so the first step we would do is the exchange of robes as an exchange of identity. The second thing we would do is the exchange of belts. What does the belt symbolize? More than holding your pants up, the belt symbolizes assets or strengths. In other words, as Steve and I are making this covenant, cutting this covenant, I'm saying everything I have, by the exchange of belts, everything I have belongs to you, and everything you have belongs to me. The third thing we would do would be the exchange of weapons that are found on that belt. What does that represent? That represents the exchange of enemies. And so I'm saying, Steve, if somebody comes after you, they're going to have to take me on first. I'm going to take on your enemy. And when someone comes after me, you're going to take them out before they ever get to me. The exchange of weapons in the ancient covenant making ceremony represented an exchange of enemies. Now, that's the first three steps we would do. The fourth step we would do 
would be a sacrificial animal would be cut. In the cutting of a covenant, the word cutting, there's always the shedding of blood. And so, here we'd be making the covenant with each other, and we would sacrifice an animal. We would take a heifer, <coughs> a cow, and we would slice it on the underbelly, on the underbelly of the animal, slice it from top to bottom, and lay the parts over against each other. That's the fourth step of the covenant-making ceremony in that culture. The next thing we would do would be the walk of death. Walk of death means I'm giving up my identity and it will forever be blended with my covenant partner, the other tribal chief, Steve Riggle. <clears throat> Steve would walk through the part, come around it, come again uh, through it, and around the other side, and, and having completed a figure eight, be right back where it was. I would walk through the animal, come around this side, come back through the animal again, come back on the other side, I would end right back up where I was standing before, having completed a figure eight, sacrif the sacrificing of an animal. And then the walk of death. After that, the next step would be a mark placed on the body. Now, it varied from culture to culture where the mark was, but in much of ancient culture, they would make a small incision on the wrist. They would take their wrist and blend them together to blend their blood together as a symbol of the oneness they now enjoyed with each other. In some primitive cultures, they would actually rub an abrasive substance like a gunpowder to leave sort of a permanent mark there. They, they, it said, we have no way of proving this, but it suggested that the origin of the modern wave, when you wave to somebody, hi, how you doing? Was to reveal the covenant mark, to warn the person coming, I've got a covenant partner, you better be careful who you mess with out there. Someone, there's another set, someone, there's another set of fists prepared to defend me if necessary. So now we've had exchange of robes, belts, weapons, the sacrificial animal, the walk of death, the mark on the body, and now Steve and I would face each other and there would be a, ceremony, a part of the ceremony called the pronouncements of blessings and curses. <clears throat> and I would say, Steve, so long as you keep the terms of this covenant, blessed shall you be when you rise up, when you lay down. Blessed shall you be when you go out, when you come back in. Blessed shall be the fruit of your wife, your children, your offspring, and all the assets you have. But if you violate this, cursed will you be when you rise up, cursed will you be when you lay down, and we'd go through that whole litany. Then he would turn to me and say the same thing, the pronouncement of blessings and curses. Blessings, if we keep the covenant, if there's a violation of the covenant, a release of curses. The next thing would be a covenant meal shared together. And so we would sit down before a crowd of witnesses in an open field, and we would share a meal together in which I would feed him the first bite of that meal. He would feed me and saying, as you're taking this, it's like you're ingesting me. Our identities are being wrapped in one. That's the origin of the wedding feast. When a bride and a groom serve each other the wedding cake, that's the origin. It's not just because it makes a nice photographic experience. It's because that's a part of the covenant-making ceremony from the ancient world. And then there would be the exchange of names. I would say from this moment on, standing before a crowd of witnesses in an open field in the covenant-making ceremony, from this moment on, I will no longer be called just Jim Garlow. I will put a piece of his name in mine. My name will now be Jim Riggle Garlow. His name now, he will announce to me, will now be Steve Garlow Riggle. So every time we even say our names, we're announcing who our covenant partner is. There's one more step to the covenant-making ceremony. We'll go into that in just a little bit later. Now, I'll look at your outline right now. Now, having said that, I made the, case, the claim that there are hundreds of verses that make no sense unless you understand the nature of the covenant-making ceremony. Let me prove what I've just said. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 18. 1 Samuel 18. There's a lot of scriptures listed on your outline. We won't get to near all of them. I'll refer to some of them. A few of them I want you to turn to. This is one, 1 Samuel chapter 18. <clears throat> In this particular verse, we're seeing an exchange between Jonathan, son of Saul, a, a, a paranoid king, and David, young David. And they are cutting a covenant. Now here's what it says in that passage, 1 Samuel 18. And we'll start at verse 3. Then Jonathan made a covenant, there's that word, with David, because he loved him as himself. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David. 
and with his armor, including his sword and his bow and his belt. What did we just read? This passage makes no sense unless you understand the steps of the ancient covenant-making ceremony. He exchanged robes. This is a rich, wonderful, spectacular. Let me, let me just stop here for something that is really offensive to even say, but I want to equip you against the bizarre arguments of the world. The homosexual community uses this text as some kind of a pathetic justification claiming that these two are homosexual, swapping robes and garb. They have no clue what's going on here. These were two people in honorable position doing what was normal at that time when you cut a covenant with someone, as, as Steve and I would do is say tribal chiefs in that culture. They're cutting a covenant with each other in which the first step was the swapping of the outer garment, the identif identification being confused. And the next step was there goes the armor. In other words, they exchanged enemies. And it says, look, and his belt, what's his belt? They were exchanging assets. And so in 1 Samuel 18, we have a classic example of a passage that makes no sense at all, unless, unless you understand the steps of the ancient Near East covenant-making ceremony. And then let's go to Genesis 15. Here in Genesis 15, starting with verse 7, we're going to see the example of a, the covenant-making ceremony where the sacrificial animal being cut and the walk of death, I talked about it a moment ago. Now this passage, hear me carefully, is one of the most strategically placed passages in the entire Bible. The implications for this passage right here, for you, are astounding. We'll unpack that a little bit later. But let's read a portion of it right now. Genesis 15, 7. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. And he, as Abram said, O Lord God, how may I know that I shall possess it? Now what's happening so far? We're, we're listening in. We're eavesdropping on a conversation between God and Abraham. And Abraham says, hey, God, you, you promised me the land. Um, are you going to deliver? God says, yep. Abram's asking for a contract. So what does God say? He says to me, we're now at verse um, 7, not 9. So he said to me, bring me a three-year-old heifer. Now here's what Abram did not say. Abram did not say, what? I asked for a contract for the land, and you want me to bring you a cow? What's wrong with this picture? Nothing, if you understand the ancient steps of the covenant-making ceremony. Because this is the contract. This is the covenant being made. Here we go. Bring me a three-year-old heifer. Now we're going to skip down. Verse 10. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other. Now we're going to skip down to verse 12. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. I want you to remember that. That's extremely important. That passage right there about a deep sleep coming on Abram has unbelievable implications for you in a positive way. But we'll unpack that just a little bit later. So remember that phrase. Abraham, how is it possible that Abraham, on the most important day of his life, cutting a covenant with God? And he fell asleep and he missed it. Let's keep reading. We're going to see more about that later. And when the sun was going down, the deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, great terror and great darkness fell on him, Verse 17, and it came about when the sun had set that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven. What's that? Park that in your brain. We're going to come back to it. And a flaming torch. Hmm, what that, would that be? Which passed between these pieces. Oh, we do recognize that. It passed between these pieces. In other words, this is a covenant-making ceremony. They cut the animal in two. They're passing between the, pace, the pieces. The other things we've talked about, just park those for a moment. We're going to come back to them. On that day, what day? That day. The day they cut the animal and they passed between the pieces. On that day, they cut a covenant. They made, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. To your descendants I have given this land. Now watch this next phrasing. From the river of Egypt, that's the Nile, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. You don't have time to stop here except to say this. When you listen to all the news that comes out every day out of Israel, just constantly, when you hear of the enemies of Israel trying to take their land, uh, the, the, the Jews don't occupy Israel. They own it. It's theirs because God says it's theirs. And, and forever, from, from 70 A.D. up until 1948, people say, well, I guess the Jews aren't going to have their own land. I guess 
I guess the Bible's got to be understood some other way. We've got to interpret it some other way. In 1948, God says, I've had enough of that. I'm going I'm to show who I am. I said they're going to have it. He reestablished the nation of Israel miraculously. And they keep expanding. And what's going to happen? Someday, someday. Pretty jolting news. It's not going to be the, 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 the deal of the century. Someday, they're going to have from the River Nile to Euphrates. How's that going to happen? I don't know. It's God's department. But he spoke it, and he'll, he'll make it happen. So watch anybody of the enemies of Israel still trying to take away the land that God promised to, that promised to the Jewish people. Let's go a little bit further on that. That's Genesis chapter 15. What we've seen so far is the sacrificial animal cut, and we've seen the walk of death. Now, we're going to go to Genesis 17. We won't even take time to turn to the scripture. Let me just say this much about it. It talks about a sign of the covenant. It says we're going to circumcise all the males. Why did they say that? Now, you had a great sermon from your pastor last Sunday, I found out, about circumcision. So I can shoot by this one pretty quickly because you already have the backdrop to it. But what he said, he says, we want to, we want to mark on the body, somewhere on the body, an evidence of the issue of a sign of the covenant. We're going to remove a piece of skin from the human, the male reproductive organ. Why? Why from there? Let me ask this question. What was the worst thing that could ever befall a woman in the Old Testament? Barrenness. What was the greatest asset a couple had? Procreation, the capacity to procreate. What's the greatest blessing you ever had? Children. They still are the greatest blessing, by the way. What was the, that was an agricultural, ag agrarian economy in which you needed a lot of children to till the soil. Uh, children are a blessing of the Lord then, and they're a blessing of the Lord today. By the way, that's your social security plan God designed for you. He never intended for the government to try to cover you. Your children who rise up, many children rise up and call you blessed and take care of you in your later years. That's God's social security plan for you. And so on this occasion, he says, what's the greatest asset you have to procreate? The capacity to produce offspring. That's the most valuable asset is your children. He says, on that part of your body, the male reproductive organ, <clears throat> I want a piece of skin removed as a permanent reminder that even that that is the most valuable to you belongs to me. Evidence that everything belongs to me. That helps set the stage, by the way, later for when God calls on Abram regarding, regarding Isaac. So that's Genesis chapter 17, the mark on the body. Let me ask you an interesting, a, a question here. In the David and Goliath story, if you grew up in a church, you grew up hearing that, in the David and Goliath story, when they're facing each other, is an incredible moment. And David says a strange statement. He says in that moment to Goliath, who are you, you uncircumcised character, that you could take on the armies of the living God? Why is David discussing the private parts of Goliath <laughs> in front of everybody? Because they knew exactly what that meant. That meant we're covenant kids, and he's not. It makes no difference. I'm a little kid, a shepherd kid. It makes no difference. He's 10 foot tall and has this weaponry. I'm in covenant with God. He is not. It's not the issue about the actual flesh. It's the issue of the sign of the covenant. God, he says, who are you to defy? He didn't say to defy me, David, or me, the Israel armies. He said, who are you to defy the armies of God? We are, we are circumcised. It means we have the covenant sign that we're one with Almighty God. You don't have that. Who are you to take us on? Let's go to the next one. We're up to the sixth step. We're going now for the next one, the seventh. In Deuteronomy, you read this, Deuteronomy 28, this amazing passage. It says, blessed shall you be when you rise up. Blessed shall you be when you lay down. Blessed shall be the fruit of your labor. Blessed shall be all these blessings, your wife, her offspring. Uh, blessed shall be, it says the rural economy again. Blessed shall be your, your crops, your oxen, your cattle, your donkeys, your... Uh, blessed shall be your, then verse 15 but if you violate my ways cursed shall you be that passage makes no sense unless you understand that's part of the covenant making ceremony this is God entering into a covenant and one of the steps of the covenant making ceremony is the pronouncement of blessings and curses and then we come to Genesis 14 15 well 14 18 we won't turn to it except to say here's this kind of odd things that's just stuck in the middle of the story. It doesn't, it's, it's kind of a non sequitur. It sort, of, it sort of doesn't fit. Here's this guy who's introduced for a brief moment named Melchizedek, king of Salem. Salem, peace. Jerusalem. Is he king of Jerusalem? Is he, who, who is Melchizedek? Melchizedek? We don't know. Yeah, we don't know. He says we don't know his birth. We don't know his death. Was he eternal? We don't know anything about him. He just shows up 
He's parked there for a second, and he has a meal with Abram, a covenant meal. He has wine and the bread, a covenant meal. He's, he, this is the first step that we have in chronological order in the Bible of the covenant-making ceremony of God and Abram. You say, God? Who is his Melchizedek? Well, we don't know for sure, but scholars think he's a theophany. Theos, God, fanny, a phantom, or an appearance. It's an appearance of God. You have quite a number of them in the Old Testament. Sometimes Christophanies. Christophany, Christ, appearance of Christ, before Bethlehem, before he's incarnate, before God in the flesh. Number of places in the Old Testament, you have Christophany. He shows up on scene. We don't have time to go into all those fascinating passages. This is quite likely a theophany. It's God showing up in a form. He even, Abram, pays him a tithe. Who gets the tithe? God. So God shows up in the person of Melchizedek, and there he is celebrating the covenant meal. But they even tell us what the menu was. And it's the covenant meal we're going to find cropping back up in the New Testament era. And then comes the exchange. Remember I said Steve Riggle and I would exchange names so we'd have a piece of our name in each other? In Genesis 17, same chapter as the circumcision, we have another step in the covenant-making ceremony. What happens? They exchange names. Abraham's name became Abraham. Now, in the Hebrew, there are no vowels. In ancient Hebrew, they, they added vowels later. In the ancient Hebrew, there's only consonants. And so Abram was his name, and they added another consonant, an H sound. In the Hebrew alphabet, there's two letters that sort of, can, effectively the same as our H, sort of. One of them's a real guttural sound. <sighs> uh, the other one's a softer. <sighs> and what does that mean? The <sighs> It ties in with a, a word in the Old Testament Hebrew called ruach, the, the, the breath of God. Adam was a bunch of dust until God blew into him, and he became a living being. The breath of God puts life. And so Abram's name is changed from Abram to Ab. The breath of God now puts life on the sky and his descendants, which includes you spiritually, in a most unique way. And Sarai becomes, hey, Abram, I hear, I hear you. You have a new covenant partner. What's your name? Yeah, my name's not Abram. Well, what is it? My name is Abe. Wow, him. Oh, you're in covenant with him? Oh, you know, to this day, would you watch the news from the Middle East? The enemies of Abram have never figured out that the Israelites, the Jews, are a part of the covenant. This multi-generational is still going. They're still part of that covenant. Abe, wow, him. Don't mess with them. They're part of God. And Sarai became Sarah. And on top of that, God took upon himself Abram's name. And from that point on, he's called the God of Abraham. Cut a deal with Isaac later, the God of Abraham and Isaac. Cut a deal with Jacob, the God of Abraham and Isaac. Jacob, it's multi it's multi-generational anyway, continues to pass on. Then we come to the last one, but we're going to skip that one and we'll come back to that one later. Now, whenever a covenant ceremony happened, I'm not suggesting in the ancient Near Eastern world they had all 10 of these steps all the time. Some they had one or two or three or four or five. In the ancient primitive cultures, they had numerous of these happening. I suppose sometimes they had all 10. There was even a couple more we won't go into. The planting of a tree. To, to, mine, to, to, to mark a covenant, you would plant a tree as a reminder, which is part of the explanation for over in the New Testament. Jesus, the planting of a tree. By that I mean in the tree of the cross of Christ Jesus, which, by the way, his crucifixion would have been a cross piece nailed to an existing tree, not like we tend to, 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 to picture in our own mind. And we also have the pile of stones, making a permanent reminder or a memorial, stacking up the stones in a way so they'll all remember a particular event. And that's part of the covenant-making ceremony, why you see that happening in, in the Old Testament. Now let's go to the New Testament. We get to the New Testament, and it's called the New Covenant. Hebrews chapter 7 and chapter 8 have verses that say, hey, I'm going to cut a new covenant with you. It's a better covenant. Really, the old covenant wasn't half bad. It wasn't too shabby. It was a pretty nice one. We have a better one. How is it going to be better? I said, well, Hebrews 10 says, you've been dealing with the shadow. Now you're going to deal with the real thing. What does that mean? 
There are lights up there, and my hand is right here, and you can't see it there, but on the floor of this platform, I can see, because of those lights in my hand, I can see the shadow of my hand. Now, if all I had to go by what a hand looks like was the shadow, I'd know a lot about the hand. As I move my hand, I'm watching that right now, it tells me a great deal about what a hand is like. But that shadow's only two-dimensional. What makes this better than the shadow is it's incarnated. Carne in Spanish, flesh. It's in flesh. It's the enfleshment. Now we've got three-dimensional. We're not just two-dimensional, a shadow. Now we can see every aspect of the hand. So the new covenant is no longer a shadow. It's the enfleshment. It's going to be a whole lot better covenant. How is it? When Jesus and I made covenant, we went out into an open field before a crowd of witnesses. And Jesus looked at me. He says, that's a pretty pathetic robe you've got on, that robe of sinfulness. It's horrible. I said, I know, Jesus. It's really bad. He says, I've got a robe of righteousness. I says, yeah, Jesus, I know. That's really cool. He says, I'll tell you what, Jesus. And Jim, he says, I'm going to swap you. Let's swatch, swap outer garments. Are you kidding me? Jesus, you're going to give me your robe of righteousness? You're going to take my robe of sinfulness? Yep, let's swap. And we swapped jackets that day. And I wrapped myself in that robe of righteousness. And the Father looks at me, and he sees the righteousness of Christ. You sang a song a little bit ago. It said, my defense, my righteousness. Really? What righteousness do you have? If I buried into your life very much, I'd find a bunch of junk. Right? And you just sang about your righteousness. That's covenant language. You just swapped out her garments with him. My defense, my righteousness, he, the righteousness of Christ that came upon me. And then he took upon my robe of sinfulness, my junk. The father looked at him, saw that junk, and he paid a high price for that exchange. The confusion of identities. That's exactly what it's saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He made him to become sin. I don't even understand what that means. I just know it's there. I believe it. I can't explain. He didn't just take on my sin. He became sin for me. I haven't unpacked that one yet theologically. And then I'm wrapped in the righteousness of Christ. Many of the passages, let me say it again, hundreds and hundreds of passages in the Bible make no sense unless you understand the steps of the ancient covenant-making ceremony. And then Jesus and I standing out there in an open field for a crowd of witnesses, we swapped belts. We swapped strength. Let's go, let's read a text, if you would, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. <clears throat> Here's what it says. I'm going to pick it up partway through. Uh, 12, uh, 9. Now, I will rather boast about my weakness that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses. Really? I haven't met very many people content with weaknesses. Unless you understand covenant. I am well content with weaknesses, insults, distresses, persecutions, difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That is an irrational statement. That's illogical. When you're weak, you're weak. When you're strong, you're strong. You don't say, oh, when I'm weak, I'm really strong. That's ludicrous. Unless you understand covenant. I'll boast about my weakness because in the covenant-making ceremony, I became strong. We swapped belts, Jesus and I did, and I got the asset. And you know what he took? He took my weakness. You know how I know that? Because 700 years before it happened, Isaiah said, guess what? He went like a lamb to slaughter, a silent lamb. Walking. The, the, the weakness that I would have had, he got led to slaughter in that way. And let's talk about more about the belts. We've talked so much belt. Let's go to the weapons. We're on the third step of the covenant-making ceremony. Jesus and I swapped weapons. Go to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10. You have, you have read, if you grew up in church, you've read this many times. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. You know what it does not say? Finally, be strong in you, in the strength of your might. Why doesn't it say that? Because of the covenant. That's covenantal... Like hundreds of passages, this is covenantal language. How can you be strong in somebody else's strength? You can't, unless there's been an exchange take place. So be strong in somebody else's strength. Whose? His, your covenant partner. Be strong in the strength. 
And it goes on to say, put on the full armor of you. Hello? Talk back to me. Did you say that? Put on the full armor of you? No. What's it say? Put on the full armor of? You're putting on somebody else's armor. And if we took time to go through the whole list, none of that's your stuff. It's all his. It's all his pieces of weaponry. It's his military hardware. You're putting that on. It makes no sense unless you understand the nature of covenant. And you know what? Remember I said, if you exchange, if you exchange weapons, that's symbolic. You're exchanging enemies. Well, really, who's his greatest enemy and who's your greatest enemy? You're swapping them. His greatest enemy is Satan. We know that from Genesis 3.15. All the way back in the beginning, Genesis 3.15. Enmity, boom, they're clashing immediately. That's his greatest enemy. What's your greatest enemy? Death. You, you, can't, you can't stop that baby. Death's coming at you. Unless somebody could take it on and work through that and cause death not to really be the kind of death we all would dread. But instead, it's a, way, a passageway to eternal life. You take on his enemy, you take, he takes on He took on death and took away its sting and gives you a promise. Somebody back there between services told me, my mother passed away two weeks ago. And she says, but she's walking the streets of gold and she's so excited right now. That's because Jesus took on our enemy. That's covenantal language. And what's his enemy? Satan. Now, what does it say about Satan? All the way through the New Testament, every time it references Satan, it never says, hey, if he starts bugging you, call me and I'll get there quickly. To the contrary, when it discusses this, it always says, if you're going to mess with Satan, you take him off. If he comes in and starts messing you over, you take him on. You resist him. You take him on. You, you put a stop to him. Why? Because we've swapped enemies. And we've also swapped strengths and assets. And he says, you take on his enemy. Let's go on to the next one. Next one is a sacrificial animal has to be sacrificed. And so the sacrificial animal we learn in this case is the Lamb of God. Jesus becomes the sacrificed one. In Matthew 27, it's unusual. As he dies, it, makes, it tells us that at the moment he died, the veil was torn in two in the temple. My own belief is, my personal opinion is, is that Jesus was crucified on the Mount of Olives because the, the, the centurion who was watching this is able to see right across into the temple mount, into the temple, and there he's observing this and this. Jesus dying, and he looks at the temple mount, and there he sees this gargantuan curtain, unbelievably tall, huge, wide, and thick. And that thing is ripped from top to bottom. Just, and all of a sudden, where you've not had access into the Holy of Holies, intimacy with God, now through what happened on this cross behind him, he, we all have access directly into the presence of God. Hebrews interprets this for us. Hebrews says, that veil that tore, that was his body. That veil tore from top to bottom. Symbolically, like the heifer, was cut from top to bottom. The body of Jesus now ripped into the gains you access. That's all covenantal language making no sense unless we understand that. And then the walk of death. Let's go to Luke chapter 9, and then we'll go to Luke chapter 17. Take a look at Luke chapter 17 first. It says, whoever keeps his life will lose it. That's irrational, unless you understand covenant. He who, seek, who seeks to keep his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life shall preserve it alive. That's the walk of death. You walk to, your, walk to death of your individual identity and you wrap your identity with the one who can keep you for eternity. Or Luke chapter 9 says, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Why is the New Testament all this death to self language? Die to self, die to self, death to self. Why does it have that language? That's covenantal language. When you're out and making covenant and the animal's been cut, and as part, you have the walk of death. You walk through that. You're now giving up your agenda. Your identity has now been forged forever into your covenant partner. That's covenant language when we talk about that. Go to the next one, circumcision. You had a sermon on this a week ago. So again, I go by it quickly. The mark on the body of circumcision in the Old Testament 
becomes spiritualized by Paul in Romans chapter 2, the circumcision of the heart. Now, what is the picture of circumcision in the Old Testament in addition to what I've already said about that? The cutting away of flesh. Now, there's two ways of understanding the words flesh in the New Testament. One is understanding it simply this, skin. The other is fleshly desires or worldly desires or inappropriate desires. The cutting away of flesh is a picture of cutting away the desire of the sinful trash and junk and garbage of the world. Circumcision of the heart means I turn from the junk. My heart has been circumcised and my heart is now drawn towards that which is holy and righteous. So the mark of the covenant, the circumcision of the heart is lived out in Romans uh, chapter two. And then when Jesus and I made covenant, there was the pronouncement of blessings and curses. But listen what happens on this one. In, in Philippians chapter four, it says he, he'll, he'll just, he's gonna meet all your needs according to his riches. He's going to meet all my needs according to his riches. Well, how much riches does he have? He's going to meet it in accordance with his riches. How much does God have? Everything. You go, wow. In accordance with his riches, that's in accordance with everything. He can meet any need that I possibly have. That's the blessing of walking with him. But something strange happens here. Whereas all these other steps of the ancient covenant-making ceremony translate directly from the Old Testament into the New, this one doesn't quite completely do it. Why? The curse is not passed on to you. Pronouncements and blessings and not curses. Why? Because somebody was there. Jesus was there. And here we find this incredible scripture. He absorbs the total impact of the curse. In fact, it says in Galatians chapter 3, 13, having become a curse for us, cursed is he who hangs on a tree. Somehow, in this pronouncement of blessings and curses, the blessings keep coming at me. But somebody said, I'm going to take the full brunt of the curse. Cursed is he who hangs on a tree. And he became cursed for me. Let me rephrase what I said a moment ago. I don't understand it. When Paul writes to the church in Corinth, it says he, Jesus, became sin. He didn't just take our sin. He became sin for us. It's an interesting construct. In the Old Testament, the word atonement, has the meaning of to cover our sins. That's good. I'd want my sin covered. You get to the New Testament, you know what? It's not atonement anymore in that sense, that definition. New Testament, your sins are gone. I'd rather have them gone than just covered. So they're covered, you can, maybe they can uncover them somehow. But in the New Testament, you're gone. Somebody became a curse for you. Now it's at this point, I want to take you back to the Old Testament, to Genesis 15. Do you remember a moment ago where I said, Abram fell asleep? Yes? Not at me, yes or no? Okay, we're going to go back to that passage, Genesis 15, 12. This is during the time that the covenant is being cut between Abram and God. Genesis 15, 12. Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. Boy, that's a bummer. Now, my, my granddaughter, Haley, is right here. And she's engaged to Gabriel. She's engaged to Gabriel, the angel. Okay, she's, it's not the first time he's heard that joke. Okay, I'm sure. Uh, my granddaughter's marrying a, uh, an angel just like her grandmother married an angel. Okay, okay. <laughs> so they're getting married on 10, 15, 20. How's that for a cool date? 10, 15, 20. October the 15th at, on 2020. So they're engaged and they're getting married. Now suppose that we come to the wedding and we're all excited and we can't wait. And she walks down the aisle. We said, where's Gabriel? Where's Gabriel? What happened to Gabriel? He says, oh, he's back at the hotel. He's sound asleep. He falls asleep. <laughs> it would be over, okay? You don't, you don't miss your wedding. You don't miss the covenant ceremony. Remember that, by the way. <laughs> Abram came to the most important moment, a covenant-making ceremony, and he slept through it. What's going wrong with this story? The answer is nothing. This is breathtaking, and it has you written on every bit of it. We come to the covenant making ceremony. Here's Abram. Here's God. They cut the heifer. Genesis 15, he says, go get a heifer. Cut it in two. We're going to make a covenant right now, buddy. Okay? Abram's there. God's there. He's ready to mark. And all of a sudden, Abram goes, boom, boom. God anesthetizes him. Knocks him out cold. A deep, not just asleep. He's out. He's a deep sleep. Why? 
Because once you walk through that part, if you violate the terms of the covenant, it's toast. It's over for you. And God knew Abram couldn't keep it. So who comes through first? Well, let's just read. What does it say here in the text? We're, and it, and we're verse 17. So it's 1517 of Genesis. And it came about when the sun had set and it was very dark. Behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between the parts. What is that talking about? Smoking oven. God shows up in the Old Testament called a theophany. We talked about earlier. A theophany. He shows up oftentimes as smoke or fire or cloud or whatever. Here he comes through as a smoking fire pot. And God, the Father, has moved through. That's the first one. But who's going to complete it? One of the techniques of the covenant-making ceremony, one of the steps, is having a representative to go through for you. And God has arranged for his son, the flaming torch. This is Jesus, the pre-incarnate one. This is pre-Bethlehem Jesus. This is Jesus before flesh. This is the second member of the Trinity saying, I'm going to walk through there as a representative. You know what that means? When Abraham comes to and violates any any portion of that covenant, if he commits one of the tiniest sins, whoever walks through in his behalf is going to die for it. That's you sleeping there. God said, I love you so much. I don't want you to walk through that animal. Because you walk through that baby, it's toast for you because you're not going to be able to keep it. Abraham, I'm going to knock you out and all your descendants. You're embryonically present in Abraham. The spiritual descendants, you're sleeping. You know what? Jesus says, okay, okay, here I go. I'm walking through there. Abram walks up, wakes up. His descendants wake up, physical ones and spiritual ones, and they sin. Jesus went to a cross, and he died for you. Genesis 15, 7 and following says he fell asleep. And we would read through that and not realize that is one of the most breathtaking declarations of the gospel and what you got set free from. It's remark. The covenant's a good thing. Let's go on to the next one. We're on the, the next one, the covenant meal. When Jesus and I entered into a covenant, we sat down to a covenant meal. Jesus in John chapter 6 is talking to the Pharisees, people who should have understood the nature of covenant. He says, I tell you guys, unless you drink my my blood and eat my flesh, you're not going to be one with me. They go, oh, yuck. That sounds cannibalistic, gross. They don't get what he's talking about. They're totally missing it. Paul writes in, in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul's going to make this a little clearer. Let's go to that one, 1 Corinthians 11. It says, now we're in verse 27. 11, 27 of 1 Corinthians. Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, whoever's flippant about this covenant thing, not good shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But, verse 28, let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. In other words, be careful of this covenant meal. When you take a communion meal, that's why the pastor says you examine your heart before you do this. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself. If he does not judge the body rightly, if he doesn't take it seriously. For, and then Paul writes to the church in Corinth. The church in Corinth was a mess. Now, he loved the church in Philippi. He let all the Philippians as a tender, wonder, wonderful, warm letter. That church was great. No problems. But other, some of the other churches were, were pretty bad and had problems. That's why half of your New Testament is written because there were problems in those churches. But none worse than Corinthians. The Corinth, Corinth church was, was a mess. A lot of junk going on there. And he says, let me tell you, some of you people are sick and some of your numbers have died because they were flippant in the covenant-making meal. That's pretty strong language. I'm not saying everybody who gets sick and everybody who dies is because of that. I'm not saying that at all. But in that particular case, he was giving them a clear warning. Some of you guys, some of your people have croaked here because you are flippant about the covenant making ceremony. This is serious stuff. The covenant of Almighty God. And then Jesus and I, we were participating in the covenant making ceremony before a crowd of witnesses in an open field, and we exchanged names. Jesus says, I'm going to give you a piece of my name. And so from that moment on, I've been called, from the, according to the book of Acts, Christian. Christian, I-A-N suffix. It means somebody who's of somebody else. So a Christian is somebody who's of Christ. And Jesus took on my name. How did he do that? Could have been called Son of God, Son of God, Son of God, Son of God, which he was. 
but he chose to take upon my name, son of man, son of humanity. He took upon our name and has called that ever since. And then we come to the final step of the covenant-making ceremony, which I skipped before, but I'm going to cover right now. And that is the exchange. Well, let me just go back. Suppose Steve Riggle and I were making covenant in open field before a crowd of witnesses. Steve and Becky have two daughters, but let's assume for this illustration they had a son. And let's suppose the son's name is Tommy, figurative son for the story. So we come to the last step of the covenant-making ceremony. The final step of the covenant-making ceremony is the exchange of the oldest male child, patriarchal culture, exchange of the oldest male child. So I stand facing Steve, he faces me. I turn to my son, my oldest son, his name is Joshua. I said, Joshua, you're my son whom I love. But we're coming to the stage of proving or testing, remember that language, proving or testing the covenant. So I take Joshua's hand, I'd walk over, I said, Steve, this is my son Joshua, whom I love so dearly. But to prove or test this covenant is for real, I'm placing his hand in yours. He will go to your house. He will live with you. Steve would take the son, hand of his son, Tommy, and he'd walk with Tommy over to where I am. He'd look at Tommy and say, Tommy, I love you. You're my son. But the proving or testing of this covenant, I'm going to now surrender you as a son to Jim. You will live at his house as, as if you are his son. Now, that's what happens in Genesis 22. Let's go to Genesis 22. Genesis 22, we have a remarkable moment in which now there can be the exchange of the oldest male child. Now, how is this going to happen? Because, by the way, you need to know one more thing. There are different kinds of covenants. There's the parity covenant. There's the suzerain covenant in that culture. A parity covenant is among equals. If Steve and I were making covenant, we're essentially equals, and so we'd be exchanging as equals what's called a parity covenant. But there's another kind of covenant. It's called suzerain treaty or suzerain covenant. What is that? A suzerain covenant is from, uh, between somebody who has everything and somebody who's got nothing. So if a king makes a covenant with a peasant, then we're going to make a covenant. We're going to give everything we have to each other, access to each other. And the peasant says, I, I don't have it. You, you have everything. You're the king. You got everything. I, I have nothing. And the king says, oh, yeah, you got something. What do I have? You. That's what you have. You have you. I want you. So this covenant we're entering into with God is not a parity covenant. This is not among equals. This is suzerain. He's got everything. We have nothing except us. He says, I, I want you. Now, in Genesis 22, a remarkable passage God turns to Abram and says, Abram, yep, your son, this is the final step of the covenant-making ceremony. Abram does not go, what? Are you kidding me? This is my boy. He didn't do that because he knew what this meant. And so he takes Isaac and they walk for three days. It takes him three days to get to Mount Moriah. For three days in his heart, Isaac is as good as dead. He gets there. Isaac is not a baby. He's strong enough that he could haul all the wood up the hill, a steep incline. Actually, Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah, which is the Temple Mount today in Jerusalem. He's hauling all this wood. By the way, wood in the Hebrew is the same word. Wood and tree are the same. He's hauling his wood up this hill. Hey, hey Dad, we got the wood for the fire. We got no, no sacrifice. Yahweh, Yira. God will provide, son. Let's keep going. They get up there. He raises the knife to take his boy's life as a way of giving him to God. And God says, hey, Abraham, Abraham stop, stop, stop. I, I know you understand the covenant-making ceremony. You've got to give up your, this, this is the promised kid. This is oldest child by Sarah, the only one by Sarah. So you've you got to give up your child. We, we know that, Abram, but I've seen in your heart. How do we know what's going on inside of Abram? Hebrews 11 tells us. Hebrews 11 says he knew that God would have to resurrect Isaac from the dead because he's the promised kid. So he's going to have to be alive. But one of the steps of the ancient covenant-making ceremony in that culture was giving up your oldest male child to the other party. So he's doing it. He says, but he knows that God's going to have to raise him from the dead. How did Abraham know that? Where had Abraham ever seen a resurrection? He hadn't. Never occurred. No recorded history of such a thing. He had such enormous faith, he thought God could do something that had never been recorded in all of history. 
God's that powerful. He's that trustworthy. That's why Abram's faith is so jolty. We know about resurrections. We've heard about them. Jesus, Lazarus. We, we've got, we got a little bit of recorded history here. He had never heard of such a stone thing, but he knew that God was going to take care of this. No, he gets ready to sacrifice him. God says, hey, stop, stop, stop. Look, in your heart, Hebrews 11, I've got a glimpse in your heart. I know what's going on psychologically with you right now. You have, you've, already, you've, already, you've already taken his life. You've already given him up. So let's save us both a lot of time. Because you're going to take his life, I'm going to have to resurrect him. No point in going through that because you've already effectively done that in your heart. And, 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 and at that moment, God says, let me back up. He says, you went three days. Did you catch that? Three days he was dead. Later we're going to hear about three days Jesus being dead. He carried the wood, wood and, and, and cross, or wood and tree is the same thing in the Hebrew. We don't know how old Isaac was. Some people think he's 33 years of age. We don't have a clue on that part. Abram at this point, God says at this point, Genesis 22, Abram, do you know what you've just done? Do you know what you've just done, Abram? Paraphrasing Genesis 22. Because you have done this, what's this? Because you've sacrificed your only boy in your heart. Because you've done, you've sacrificed your son, I can sacrifice my son, and the covenant is now for real. It will hold. It was locked in at that moment. Then he goes, Genesis 22. Hey, you know what you've just done further? What, God? I'm paraphrasing Genesis 22. I'm going to give you the gates of the city. Gates? Who wants a bunch of gates around the front yard? Unless, you understand what gates are. Gates are the, the, the source of authority and power. The elders sat by the gates. They controlled the commerce. They controlled the politics. They controlled everything. He who controls the gates of a city controls the city. The elders sat there open or closed. They dictated. They could tell what comes in and what goes out. The power was the gates. I'm going to give you the power. I'm giving you the gates of your enemies from this moment on. Where do you find that language covenantally in the New Testament? When Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples, he's in Caesarea Philippi. He says, hey, guys, who do you think I am? Jesus had never put him on the spot like that. He had never told him who he was. He told the woman at the well, Samaria, he told her who he was. That's the first time he told anybody who he was. Nobody else was he that, nearly that clear with. And he says, who do you guys think I am? Peter was always the first to talk. He wore mint-flavored sandals because he put his foot in his mouth so much of the time. He said some pretty stupid things. But this time it was a ringer. He said, we know who you are. The rest of the disciples go, oh, Peter, what are you doing right now? We know who you are, Jesus. Who am I, Peter? You're him. What do you mean him? Christos, Messiah. You're, 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 you're God. We know who you are. You're God. Jesus looks at him and says, Peter, there's no way you learned that in seminary. You did not look that. Look, you did not look up a book and find that. The only way you can know that is my father told you directly. Otherwise, you'd have no way of knowing that truth. He says, I'm telling you what, based upon this, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. The truth's out on me now. I'm giving you authority. Let me borrow your keys for a second. Oh, thank you. Okay, here's, here's the keys to, to, to Steve's vehicle. Can Steve run that vehicle? No. No, he cannot. But I, Gabriel, I'm going to give you the keys to that vehicle. Now, who can drive it now? He can. Not him, but he can. Why? You have the keys. He who has the keys has authority. And Jesus says, I'm going to tell you something, disciples. I'm going to tell you something, church. Steve's getting nervous. <laughs> and if you saw that vehicle, I rode in it this morning. It says, thou shalt not covet, but I violated that rule this morning. He says, church, I'm going to give you the keys. I'm going to give you authority. The Amplified Version says it this way. What, this is in prayer. What you declare to be legal, appropriate, and right, I'm going to back you up on it. What you, in conformity with God's will, what you declare to be inappropriate, illegal, I'm going to stop that in your behalf. You know, we pray, we pray prayers. I've prayed, I've prayed thousands of prayers that I've closed with. In the name of Jesus, I pray. I've never once said, in the name of Jim, I pray. I have authority to use Jim's name. What gives me the authority to use somebody else's name? 
I couldn't say, in the authority of Steve, I do this. I can't go over here to Lexus and buy a car and say, I'm here by the authority of Becky Riggle. Well, no, maybe I, I, I try that. That'd be kind of cool. I have no authority to use her name over there. I have no authority to use mine. So why would I end a prayer in the, in the name of somebody else, in the name of Jesus? Unless you understand covenant. You've been operating the covenant all this time. You have an exchange of names going on here. And so, he says, I'm going to give you the authority. I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. Now, it means, what's the implication for this right now for you and me? It means there's two ways we can pray. First one's not bad. It's just not covenantally powerful. The first one is you look at God. Oh, God, I need this. God, I need this. Oh, God, would you help me? God, God, would you please do this? God, I need you to do this. God, I need this. Or sometimes I pray like this. God, help. It's okay. I've prayed a lot of prayers like that. God, help. Nothing wrong with that prayer. It's just not as effective in terms of covenantal power, release of covenantal power. Turning to God and begging him for things he already wants to give you. Instead, when you're in covenantal power, you're operating in his name. You'd now turn your back to him because he's backing you up. He's your covenant partner, remember? Remember you exchange, you did all the mark. And by the way, Jesus, if he'd have waved at you, if Jesus would have waved at you, you'd have seen a covenant mark about right here. Uh, the nail didn't go through there. It, wouldn't have hung it went through right here. Yod, yod, it, it means hand in Hebrew. It includes the wrist. Jesus had a covenant mark right there. Isn't that interesting? So now, the fact that we're covenant partners, I'm ready to pray. And God's behind me, backing me up. And I start declaring those things that are in conformity with his word and his will. I start declaring inappropriate and illegal those things on the earth that shouldn't be here. I start declaring those things righteous and appropriate that should be here. And my prayer life becomes much more powerful at that point because now I'm praying covenantally in power and alignment with him, recognize who he is as an authority figure in my life, and I'm declaring because of the exchange of the covenant-making ceremony what he has declared, his will, will, his word, his way on planet Earth. The covenant is a good thing, our God and our Father.